this part of the conference is called turning words into turning vision into words and uh, you are all in the the action part uh, turning vision to action on Maria you are um, in the field mm -hmm. what is the most important prerequisite for practical implementation of the SDGs on the ground we are now in the the practical part yeah I would pick up what, one, what uh, Namsla was talking about, namely the, um, the, the southern ownership. Um, I think that it's very easy to fall into the trap that we think that Norwegian aid or Norwegian NGOs are going to change a lot, or international NGOs, but I think that change needs to happen from within and below. Mm. Um, so strengthening of, um, from my perspective then, of course, the, the southern civil society partners will mm. be of uh, absolute importance. Mm. Anne Birgitte, you agree? Well, I alluded a bit to this in, in my speech. No, I'm, I mean, we, I don't think any of us will, will disagree on, on the fact that mm. more and more the international NGOs need to get out of the way mm. um, and deeply examine what our Did added value is. Did you say to get out is. of the way? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, so you mean you are totally unnecessary, both the, 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 the Norwegian church aid and, and the plan? No, I, what I was saying is I think we do need to all deeply reflect on what is our added value. Mm -hmm. It's not local service delivery. It's not... Um, sometimes, and I actually agree with, with you, that, that it's not about building the capacity of local NGOs, feminist NGOs in Africa. Right. There are thousands of members of Femnet mm. that can do that a lot better than us. What we hope we can do is to connect some of the dots, connect into global organizations, networks, activities of global uh, private sector, build new collabor co collaborative platforms for, for engagement, connect civil society with the UN and the private sector, etc. We don't have all those solutions. We think we have some emerging new ways of working. But if we all lean back and say, oh, we're doing a fantastic job. We will continue doing the fantastic job we've done for the last 80 years. Even if we all doubled the fantastic work that we've done for the last 80 years, we won't reach the SDGs. So. It's about really getting out of the way of where the deep energy exists mm. in developing countries. And I think that's what we just heard, that that energy really does exist. Yeah. And as much as we can, walk with it, catalyze it, or get out of the way. Yeah, no, no, you're the one representing the deep energy. Yeah. You feel that yourself, yes? I completely agree. I think that I think that there are strategic ways in which we, we can continue collaborating, co-creating together mm. that do not cost developing systems so much. I mean, one of the things that's little talked about, I think when we're talking about the opportunity cost, the crowding out of African civil society as, as an example by INGOs, we think about it in financial terms. What we don't think about is, take for example an, an organization like Bread for the World that exists in, in the US. Bread for the World's um, primary funding comes from Americans, ordinary Americans, because they trust Bread for the World, because they see Bread for the World as representing their hearts in relation to solving the poverty problem. You can't do that in Africa, because communities in Africa don't, don't have a culture of the legitimacy of civil society. Mm -hmm. And so what we lose is not just crowding out in relation to resources, it's legitimacy, trust building, and all of those things that you need in order to, in fact, strengthen governance. And civil society, therefore, particularly homegrown civil society, is critical because without them, democracy is not going to work as it has not been working. And the only way you can make democracy work is to make sure that there are systems in place that actually can legitimately hold governments accountable. And that's African citizens organized through civil society. Mm. You're nodding. Uh, you? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. And mm. I would uh, problematize a little bit because, of course, um, civil society is not one 
thing, neither with us nor in Africa. <laughs> so it's not like saying strengthening civil society and you automatically know what to do or who the actors are, because I think there are, of course, also a whole number of briefcase NGOs showing up that are hmm. southern-based but still have no legitimacy or, you know, that still have no... Um, um, I mean, whether you hire a think tank from Kenya or from Uganda or from Rome is sometimes... Um, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't make, make much difference. But of course, the moment you get down to the actors who do have legitimacy in their local communities, um, that's when I think the change will happen. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a difficult picture to sort of look at, because mm -hmm. also talking about Norwegian NGOs or, or northern-based civil society, you're talking about very different things. Mm. Um, and I think that's a part of the beauty, because we shouldn't have... I mean, looking at all of the boxes here, I mean, I'm sure you will find both broad, legitimate, legitimate, legitimate um, NGOs or civil society actors working on this, and you will find from north, north and south, and you will find um, expert organizations working on each of these. So it's about not getting trapped into one understanding of what civil society is and who they are, but rather broadening the perspective. Mm -hmm. But then with the focus on the people who who will feel the change themselves, who want the change, because that's also, um, uh, that's the key here, I think. I want to hear you practitioners now uh, react to Homi, what he said about patience and new angles in development work on the Begitta. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, because we've worked where we have worked for so many years, we are in many respects by nature patient. Mm -hmm. um, the type of social norm transformation that we're looking for in our work does not happen overnight. Yeah. Sometimes when we start our work, we actually have to start over here with some basic service delivery in terms of engaging communities in safe water supply or sanitation. Uh, and once the communities have seen that we can deliver, that we listen to their needs, that we engage, that we don't come in with our own agenda, we can start slowly, slowly talking about other needs, ask questions. Why are the boys going to school and not the girls? Mm -hmm. Start engaging with parents around that, changing the discourse. Um, and we don't do that alone. I mean, Plan International has 10,000 staff. Only 180 of those are from the global north and are international employees. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is local. Our local facilitators live in the communities. They're born in the communities. They engage in those communities. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing takes an awful long time. So patience is absolutely critical. The problem is most government donor money is not patient mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. yeah. The money we get from our child sponsors is enormously patient. Mm -hmm. Our average retention rate of a sponsor is 13 years. They engage with the communities in which they work because they deeply believe that you have to be patient to see development happen. So what we need more as we think about funding development in the future is finding patient money mm -hmm. from those that really want to make a long-term difference. Mm -hmm. Patent money, no, no, what you think. I completely agree. In fact, as I was listening and, 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 and um, hearing Plan's experience on the ground, I think that that's the way it should, it should be. Um, but my own experience has been that the demand from the funding community is very different. And so when we shifted from this idea to this idea of, of, of results, what we defined that to be is quantifiable evidence mm. of change. And that quantifiable evidence, if you are a good girl or good boy, you can provide quarterly, mm. right? And that makes it impossible to actually think long term. And then, of course, the disruptive nature of, or the, the uncertain nature, let's call it, of funding systems as well, so that you, when you have project funding that is just for 12 months, it never really allows you to think systemically about how in the long term you build um, a, a change and sustain change. The, the, the question of languaging, and I think this is another opportunity where Southern and Northern civil society need to engage. Because in engaging with Northern civil society, one of the values I've found is that they've, because of the experience, they've developed language 
with which to convince potential donor supporters why it's necessary that you must build in specific systems. So for instance, the long-term nature of funding. Those are some of the things where I think shared learning is important because we struggle to convince. Within the African context, we struggle hugely conv to convince, particularly the funding world, why it's important to think long-term around development um, transformation. To, to continue with you, Agenda 2030 is universal. How do you think the goals and targets resonate with the development priorities from the African perspective? Do you feel at home with it? I think so, I think so. And I mean, I alluded to it when I was speaking. Um, when, when these countries are looking at their NDPs, which already pre-existed the SDGs, and they find such strong alignment, I think that that's already confirmation that there's a lot of resonance. There was, I think, at the beginning, and maybe there's some remnants of that still, some concerns around to what extent is this a global agenda and to what extent is it being imposed within the African system. Mm -hmm. But there's a very quick and good answer to that because, in fact, I think this agenda particularly, was one of the most inclusive and negotiated agendas that the UN has ever passed. And so the Africa group was very strong, both in New York, but also within the G77 group as we were negotiating. And in fact, very specific elements of the common position are now part of the SDGs, as it were. And so I think the, the important institutional structures within the African continent have, in fact, officially recognized that the SDGs um, are a useful tool, and I think that the fact that there is the integration between the social, the economic, mm -hmm. um, the environmental, and the governance issues is an important one. We're certainly as civil society leveraging that to make sure that we can force governments to talk to each other and to look at government, uh, rather at development in a holistic mm -hmm. way. Elmigit, do you have the same feeling that the SDGs really was something that was thoroughly negotiated? Um, there's, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I was on the UN side when they were negotiated, and, and it was an unprecedented two-year process that everybody was part of. Um, even to the point where, just as they were adopted, actually more or less in the same month, I transitioned from the UN to civil society. Um, and everybody on the civil society side was sort of going, gosh, you know, sometimes one has to be careful what one wishes for, no? <laughs> because we, we got it, and we got more than, than we had probably expected. Um, and that's why we Do all... Do you have an example? Like, like what? Well, I don't think any of us, neither on the UN side nor on the, uh, on the NGO side, actually thought there would be a deeply embedded inequality goal um, that, right. that was the, up yeah. until the last minute in the negotiations. Uh, the negotiation leaders were trying to throw out the inequality goal. Mm. Yeah. But it's there, and it's deeply embedded there. Now, because it, was, it came in last minute and was struggled in there, maybe that's one of the reasons why we are seeing less investment, less engagement, and that's one of the goals that's the hardest to get to. But that's where we all that fought for it mm -hmm. need to still come together and drive that. On the money. Yeah, because I think that's the goal where you most prominently can see that this is not going to be solved by aid. This is politics. And that's a whole, whole different arena where you need to talk about tax, where you need to really... Um, um, uh, why don't we have a multilateral arena, for example, for discussing tax issues and setting up a new international tax system? Because now the OECD countries are allowed to do their their own thinking and set up their own systems, whereas the developing countries are not at the table. And of course, this is, um, this is not going to be solved by aid. This has to be uh, pushed forward by political will, and that political will has to be created by people like us, I mean, civil society. Um, and I think this is, again, a good example of where civil society actors in the North and the South will have to work together to in, in order to change these political structures. I'm not, are you as uh, surprised over the inequality goal? Absolutely. The inequality goal and goal 16. I know that the Africa group particularly was negotiating well, 17, 16, goal, goal 16, that's, 16 that's institutions. Um, on, on, um, yeah. on governance, yeah. uh, peace and security, or well, peaceful societies now. 
Um, but the one thing I wanted to say, actually, is that when we see some of the political ownership at the national level, I think we must be careful, and I don't want to create this impression that there's local ownership of the SDGs mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. Because you go and talk to local governments, even provincial level, sub, sub national level, and there's just simply no knowledge or information on the SDGs. And so we ourselves have had to change our own naivety that the integration at the national level in terms of the policy and the institutional mechanisms is far from enough because now we are having to think localization. What does that mean when you are getting the implementers to actually implement according to the principles mm -hmm. of the SDGs? And that's where the heavy lifting is. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice to the donors on how everyone now can work much better to reach the SDGs? I think that I already um, alluded to it again there. Three critical things, the agency, in other words, support efforts for local ownership while continuing the collaborative engagement. And then let's work towards innovative, creative solutions. I do think that these things that we're talking about around what type of money do we need are actually quite important. And so one of the things that we are seeing emerging out of the African continent is a new type of civil society which is more about movements than it is about just structured um, uh, formal institutions. Uh, what kind of movement? So and a good example is, is this, this WhatsApp group I was talking about, or rather I haven't actually explained it. So one of the outcomes of the Ghana conversation I was talking about is that one of the suggestions was, let's continue the engagement on WhatsApp. And so then they continue to talk on WhatsApp. And I promise you three, four weeks after the conference or the summit, there's an actual movement, which we've been trying to build for 10 years, by the way, of young Africans out of the summit who are now setting up national chapters, all of which are going to be run on WhatsApp to engage young people around citizen-driven monitoring of the SDGs. It's like, I, I haven't seen anything like that happening. And so I have to even rethink myself and say, am I looking for organizations or can I identify movements? If I'm identifying movements, which are the good legitimate ones? Mm -hmm. Which are the ones that are gonna deliver results? And which ones are the fly by nights that are going to die tomorrow? And I think all of us are in a learning curve where these new disruptions are emerging. But just because they are new and riskier, doesn't mean that we don't give them attention. It just means that we need to get smarter around how we leverage them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that does mean that donor governments need to become less risk averse. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Things are changing so fast in the development world, yeah. in the partners that we work with, in the new evolving, um, yes, movements, social engagement structures, um, and, it's, I th ultimately, it's about funding the mission and the cause. And if we're aligned behind the SDGs, um, it's really not about funding a project. Yeah. It mm. is about funding the cause and the mission that we're part of. And then we, and even more so, our local partners will find the way to do that. Mm. And so all of us have to learn to become more risk-taking, I, I thought it was a fascinating uh, presentation that we got, that fundamentally, we can do great projects anywhere. <laughs> um, and we've learned that through many, many years. And I think that understanding and deep recognition needs to be held by everybody. Mm. Yeah. yeah, on the donor side, to talk about Norway specifically, I would say that, well, comparatively, Norway is doing fine on the funding side. What I really would want is to, for the Norwegian government to develop a binding actual action plan for the SDGs so we know what to achieve. And that is binding across governments because we may have a shift of government, but that the, the plan should still be there. And not only then taking the easy way out, looking at what we can do with the aid money to, to achieve it, but actually what do we need to do with Norwegian politics, that, that comprehensive side of it? What do we need to do about our own CO2 emissions, about our own trade policies? Looking at that, it's mm. going to be painful, but it's, if we are going to achieve it, this is actually what the world needs to do. Mm. Okay, we are soon wrapping up. Just to end, on, are we moving from, from, from uh, aid organizations to, to movements and politics? No. I mean, yeah, sorry. No, no go ahead, yes. please. No, I mean, 
I think the, div the technical development sector has for years eluded itself that development is not political. It is deeply, deeply political. Yeah. And owning up to that and engaging, and the only way to engage politically is through doing it together. Power comes in numbers, and those numbers will change the agendas that we want to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Namla, you get the last word. Moving over to politics. Um, I, maybe one thing that we haven't talked about is uh, Norway's potential leadership role in the global space, particularly in relation to those systemic issues that make it impossible for the developing world to actually develop. So expropriation of resources, mm -hmm. illicit financial flows, the behavior of multinational companies in our countries. I think Norway is doing brilliantly in relation to ODA, but I think there's a political global role that needs to be made or played by everyone who touts themselves to promote development to say there are systemic structural global issues that make it impossible for the developing world to own their futures and those need to be addressed in important platforms like the G8, like OECD, etc. Okay, that's the last word. I thank you very much, the three of you, for being here. Thank you. <coughs>